Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and we are continuing our look at the Pacific Campaign and we are off to Guadalcanal again, which we have covered numerous times before and indeed we've touched on some of the stories we're going to cover today in various other shows but today we're going to go through them kind of bit by bit and it is the Medal of Honor recipient so we're going to start with the Army ones and move to the Navy Marine ones but my guest, well, if you're talking about Guadalcanal there's only one person you can bring on who has the kind of knowledge that we would expect on World War II TV and it's Dave R. Holland who has since last appearance have actually toured with me in Normandy so we've become good mates now so good afternoon Dave, how are you today? Doing very well, uh, Woody, and thanks again for the opportunity, and just happy to talk Guadalcanal, as always. Well, you love to. And the, the exciting news is you're, you're off there again in a few weeks' time for your first visit in nearly five years. So so what are you looking to find this time? What's the next, What's the head of the list of things you want to research? I'm only going for a week, so I'm going from the 20th to the 27th, so i only got a week window. I've got a lot of ground to cover. So a lot of things have changed in the last four to five years since I was there. Uh, my main priority is going to be focused on the second um, Raider Battalion in their long uh, patrol of 30 days, which is probably one of the first U.S. Special Operations uh, missions in the war. Um, it hasn't really been covered much. I've, I've actually walked parts of the, the track and the trail, but there's a the largest battle I have is called Asamana, and it's kind of lost to history. I don't think the village is actually there anymore, just the site. But recently I've came across a uh, hand-drawn map of one of the lieutenants there and mm. i plan to to go on site with uh, i got a friend who's there and we're going to do some drone footage so i'm expecting big things there well and you know of course although you started your channel some time ago in the last five years it's when you've like me you've kind of gone global you've met other historians you've been to places you've been on other shows things like that and so i'm assuming the sharing of information with other historians has been really useful to you because Sometimes in my own case, you feel like you're squirreling away on something on your own and then suddenly realize there's other people around the world who've got little bits of information and can help you with things. I guess that's been a real bonus for you as well, just making contact with other people. Oh, yes, especially through channels such as you, um, yours, um, the TV, World War II TV and, and podcast and, and, and the whole social media thing. Yeah, it's just it's very um, small world, so to speak. Yeah, and it's good to find other people. Anyway, we're going to bring up your PowerPoint. I'm in charge of it today. So we're going to go through these Medal of Honours. And um, we're going to start with the Army ones, which are kind of uh, sometimes overlooked compared to the Marines, which has kind of been the theme of this week. We talked about the 37th Infantry over on uh, New Georgia a couple of days ago. So, so Dave, let's, let, we'll, we'll, we'll turn over to your knowledge. And, folks, please fire away with questions because um, here's the person here who can answer them. If anyone can answer these questions, it's going to be Dave, particularly about location and terrain and that kind of local knowledge of being there. So, um, so to, and by the way, folks, we're not quite tackling them in chronological order. We're kind of leaping through the timeline a little bit. And we're not going to do any big overviews about the campaign. And, and, and you know, we've done that before. We're just going to focus on these individuals. So over to you, Dave. Yeah, so I wanted to, to really touch base on the U.S. Army um, because, once again, they're not the, they don't get a lot of attention in the Guadalcanal campaign. So, And uh, imagine your viewers have probably never heard of these first two, at least, is uh, Fournier and Hall. And I'll mention Fournier and Hall together because they earned their um, the medals both together at the same time. So Fournier and Hall um, were in the 25th Infantry Division. So the 25th Infantry Division... The first elements arrived on Guadalcanal on the 17th of December, 42, and the other elements arrived in um, early January, 43. So the division officially relieved the 1st Marine Division, so they were off. The 1st Marine Division basically left in uh, December and January off to r and &R in Australia. So they were uh, relieved by a regular Army Division the 25th. So both these guys were in the 35th Infantry Regiment, which is a regular Army um, unit pre-war. And both of these guys here were pre-war uh, U.S. Army um, regular, so to speak. Now, Lewis Hall is a bit unique, I guess, for World War II infantrymen. Lewis Hall was, if you notice there, March the 2nd, 1895. He's 47 years old at Guadalcanal. And his tech technician fifth grade, which is, I think, roughly equivalent of a sergeant. So William Fournier was a section, or sorry, uh, Fournier was a section leader and Hall was a squad leader. Now, Hall was 47. He'd only been in for a few years in the Army. Now, Fournier had been in the U.S. Navy for 10 years, and he'd got out. I think he was in the U.S. Army for a couple of years, and the war started. 
and he I think he was about 27 or 28. So both these guys are old men, I guess, mm. compared to the normal infantry. I think the average age of a World War II U.S. Army was 26, and a, a Marine was 19. Wow. So these guys are gramps, so to speak. Especially Lewis Hall at 47. I'm not going to just imagine running through the jungles and Guadalcanal in the hills at 47 years old. And it killed guys at 20 years old, much less 47. So <clears throat> these guys were in a, a machine gun uh, section, a machine gun squad. Uh, they were an M company, which was the heavy machine or the heavy weapons company of the um, 3rd Battalion of the 35th Infantry. So what they were engaged in, there was a place called the Gifu. The Gifu is up on top of Mount Austin, and it was most heavily fortified Japanese positions during the whole campaign. So I think for those of you familiar with the Guadalcanal campaign, um, after the October battle, the last Japanese offensive, um, the Japanese basically went in, into a defense um, posture. And then in November, they will replicate their main attack on uh, Battle of Henderson Field like they did in October. But then you had the naval battles of Guadalcanal that basically stopped them in their tracks and, and, and stopped that offensive. So what they decided to do is to dig in on, on Mount Austin. And here's a good photo. Oh, sorry, a good map. This was actually a contemporary map. I love my maps, by the way. So I, I got this one. Yeah, love it. But this showed the uh, position around the Gifu. So the Gifu was basically a horseshoe-shaped position on top of Mount Austin. And it was about 1,600 yards wide. Horseshoe position, about 45 to 50 uh, Japanese coconut log bunkers interlocked in fire. So they dug in there with the expectation is, look, we'll dig in here. Uh, we'll expose or present a threat to the um, U.S. Army Marines left flank. And then we'll wait for more reinforcements and we'll start our offensive again. So the Japanese are still, uh, I think they're having a breather and they're waiting for another offensive. So they had two more divisions ready to come down. So... General Patch at that stage had, had relieved um, uh, Major General Vandegrift, the Marine commander. And Major General Patch was U.S. Army commander, and he'd taken control of the island. So he decided, okay, my orders is to clear the Japanese and push down the coast. But he had a thorn in his side, so he had these Japanese up on Mount Austin. So any offensive down the coast, you'd still have these guys on his flanks. So he had to eliminate these Japanese. So the Marikau Division was there before, and he had the 132nd uh, Infantry Regiment had, had pinned the Japanese for about four weeks on Mount Austin. So they basically dug in, no man's land, looking at each other. So the 35th, um, or sorry, the 25th Infantry arrived under, um, for those of you guys who might know the European campaign, their uh, division commander was a fellow named Joe Collins, or Lightning Joe Collins, later became uh, the Corps Commander of the 7th Corps. My grandfather was in the 7th Corps in Normandy, so he was his Corps commander. He always used to speak highly of Joe Collins. And we'll speak about Joe Collins when we talk about Charles Yeah, Darwin. I mean, I think I think yeah. historians agree that Lightning Joe is is up there as one of the, the most dynamic and, and consistently good performing commanders of World War II and 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 not unique in that he did the Pacific and, and ETO, but but it puts him in a select few, I think. Exactly. He he did very well here on Guadalcanal. He earned his spurs, so to speak. He um, got some good battlefield uh, expertise. He very, really led from the front. So the plan was um, you needed to isolate the Gifu. And the Japanese were supplying from the west side. They were supplying, have a small supply line up the Matanikau River. And it's a sheer cliff face on the west side. So they had a small track there. And that's why they did a horseshoe shape. So the rear of the horseshoe was just uh, a cliff and it's unapproachable for the Americans. But they had a small supply there line. So what the Collins wanted to do, he wanted to isolate the Gifu. So isolate the Gifu, there was a series of ridges around to the west of the Gifu or Mount Austin. And they became known as the Seahorse, the Galloping Horse, um, and another other name. So basically, and to this day, if you look at, say, Google, and flip it upside down and look at the ridges, the, the, the barren uh, coral ridges, it looks like a horse galloping. And the Seahorse looks like a seahorse. You just turn it upside down. In fact, if you turn his map upside down, you would see it. And it sticks out, and that was hence the name. So what they had to do was isolate it. So wipe out the Japanese positions and the bunker positions on the ridgelines to the west, 
Once you did that, you cut off the Japanese supplies, and then you could surround it and isolate the Gifu. So that brings us up to um, Hall and Fournier. So their plan was, if you look on the map here, this is three of the 35th in the bottom there, so the bottom right. Yep. And the right. red line is their route. So what they had to do was they had to penetrate through the jungle, and that's real thick, uh, I'm talking about real nasty jungle, deep ravines. No one goes there hardly. In fact, the, the guys I know on top has the village now at um, top of the hill where the Gifu was. They still call it the Gifu. They said in the past 15 years, they've taken other than non Solomon Islands, they've taken probably 10 people in there. And I was one of them. Wow. <laughs> so there's nine other people in the world somewhere in the last 10 to 15 years. And, you know. But anyway, they moved through there. So their plan was to come up south and take the seahorse, which is hills 43 and 44. So the 3rd Battalion was moving out, following the trails. They come to a, a fork in the Matanikau River. So Matanikau is the main river there, and it, it forks numerous, I think, four forks when it gets to the headwaters, very uh, deep ravines. So Fournier and Hall was placed on a small knoll over a stream, and they were to protect the left flank of the, the – um, the company went across the stream and moved up on the hill. So they're protecting the left flank. So Colonel Oka, which was the Japanese uh, 124th regimental commander had his um, headquarters CP, not far down the stream bed. So in the process of crossing that stream, um, you can imagine Americans were in a, we call it used to call it a, um, a dan danger zone. So they were, they were really exposed. So they come the Japanese come straight down the, the ravine and hit the, the Americans in the left flank. And what it did with Fournier and Hall, so Fournier was a section leader, so it had four machine guns. They had light machine guns at this time in 1919s. So that's, that's a good um, shot of the terrain, how thick it is. You can't really tell there, but that's a fairly recent photo, so you can tell it's still fairly isolated. So there was a deep ravine they were in. They were on a no. The Japanese come in the left flank attacking them. So they were taking a lot of fire. They lost their gunner, assistant gunner. A number of uh, men were taken out. One machine gun was completely taken out, American machine gun. So Fournier and Hall knew the threat to the, the company's flank. So they were ordered to uh, retreat back to a better position. Uh, they refused. So both of them ran into the um, gun when no one was at, and they picked the gun up. So Fournier picked the gun up by the tripod because the Japanese were down below. So the gun couldn't depress low enough to reach them. So Fournier took the gun, put it on his back, spread eagle, sorry, the tripod, and stood up. So Hall reached over the top and fired it. So they were remote. Um, that's how they could elevate it down. They kept firing on the Japanese, and they stopped the Japanese counterattack. But in the process, uh, Lewis Hall was shot and killed, and Fournier uh, received basically a mortal wound also. Um, so they stopped the Japanese attack. They protected the company's flank. And then the company were able to move across and consolidate. Um, I think Fournier died two days later. So this was on the 10th um, of January. Um, and both of them received uh, the Medal of Honor posthumously. Hmm. But there's not really much written about these two guys, unfortunately. But I guarantee you, not many of you um, viewers will even heard of these these guys. And now, I mean, the guys in even the 25th Infantry Division today, I doubt they even heard of these these two men. Well, it's the so, same old thing we're talking about with with Matt. It's just the, the Marines seem to get the press, the Army don't get the press. People like yourself, John McManus, and others are are banging the drum of the Army. But it's you know that that these our understanding of these campaigns are deeply set. We're so influenced by the movies and the imagery and the posters and the, and, and, and the Marines do just seem to, 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 to take all the highlight. Not that the, not that any Marines I know are ever um, dismissive of the army. It's, it's not, it's not the guys who were there that are part of the, of the, the way we remember it. It's kind of the media that controls it, I think. Yeah, you're right. So this is a, good, a photo of the, some of the terrain, that they had to operate in. And that's fairly clear. You can imagine that thick jungle down there. And that's what the Japanese used to do. They used to put their bivouacs in the thick jungle bottoms. I was reading the 25th Infantry Division um, after action reports. 
and it said lessons learned the japanese were bivouac in the stream so um this was artillery commander saying these lessons learned so it says it's good just to throw harassing fire into the jungle uh, ravines because that's where they base their camps um so that's basically um fournier and hall we can probably go straight to i just got the picture of the of um that's uh hall's medal of honor isn't it that's hall's it medal yes hall's medal of honor yeah and where, where's that located which museum don't really know i don't know if it's located in the um hawaii in the 25th infantry divisions um museum Sometimes they used to they put them in the local museums where the where the um, soldiers come from, the right, area, okay. or sometimes they put them in the, the U.S. Army, or sometimes because the army is so large, they put them in the division museums. So that's Fournier oh, the there. And then, yeah, I'll just show the images one more time. That's Fournier, um, and then there's Hall there, and and get the fact that they're not very well known is that these are kind of um, drawings based on on probably not very good quality photo. There's not much about these guys out there. I mean. The one, the, the figure we're going to figure uh, talk about later on, Basilone. I mean, the, the internet is swamped with images of Basilone, both you know, in service afterwards, artworks, portraits, paintings, color, black and white, movie, boy, and then these guys equally heroic. There's like basically one photo available, and it's not a very good one. No, and and I've reached out to the 25th Infantry Division Association. There's not really much on that too. I've I've done a lot of or tried to do a lot of research on these these two men, and it's it's very hard. To come well, across um, well but thanks, once thanks again that's, what you've done, but we'll move on yeah that we'll move on to, to captain davis now this guy um people probably heard of him if they haven't heard of him they probably know some facts about him now i'm gonna mention how they might know there's been two movies and a book and can you guess it woody i'm what? not gonna try i'm not gonna humiliate yeah. myself for that. <laughs> okay okay what's the a long movie. It was had all the stars in it. It was made a number of years ago, right at the same time that Saving Private Ryan came out. I guess it's Thin Red Line is the is the movie. Yes. Yeah, yes. So that's like when I said some to someone one time. I said the Thin Red Line movies, and then there's always no. There's only one movie. I said, well, there was a movie made in the 1960s, The Thin Red Line, which but, I think is actually um, a better movie in some ways. It's I'll, I'll, I won't get into that debate with it about The Thin Red Line. I mean, I don't, I don't like either of them myself. I mean, I, I know some people really love the the, mm. the 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 modern one, and some people really hate it. I do. I, there's bits of it I like, and there's other bits I just find it's mm. just it's it's yeah, it's it's a it's a definitely a, a particular type of movie that you either don't or do like. I think, but yeah, it's fairly it's very deep movie the, the modern one. But yeah. I've read the book. The books obviously better. So it's James Jones. Now I mentioned James Jones. I don't think many people know about him either. James Jones was in the second battalion of the twenty seventh regiment. Same battalion that Charles Davis was in, right? And when he wrote the book, Thin Red Line, it's a fiction book but based on, oh, sorry, yeah, it's a fiction book based on his his uh, experiences on Guadalcanal and yep. afterwards. Same as like he wrote From Here to Eternity. Yep. It was based upon his pre-war with the 25th Infantry Division, which was the regular Army Division is based at Hawaii. And they were involved in Schofield Barracks and the attack of Pearl Harbor. So these guys were, quote, combat vets um if you're going to say that uh, pearl harbor was for these guys on the ground but it was fictitious uh, book but he just he changed the name sort of protect the innocent in the places so for example the galloping horse in his book is called the dancing elephant um the captain i forgot the name of the captain in the book it's based on charles davis and the battalion commander nick nolte in the movie is based on his battalion commander uh, John Cusack in the modern movie, his his character is, is loosely based on Charles Davis. Now the right. scene where in the movie where they charge the bunkers is pretty accurate, and even the terrain is pretty accurate because they filmed parts of it actually at movie. I don't really want to talk about this isn't about the thin red line, but they filmed parts of that on Guadalcanal. But the scene on the bunkers were filmed in northern Queensland in Australia, which is very similar to it. But Charles Davis, Charles Davis. Um, I like him because he's from Alabama originally. Um, he's an Alabama guy. So he's, he was commissioned. Um, and he was in the 2nd Battalion of the 27th uh, Regiment, which is, what I said before, a pre-war regular unit. Um, so what he did – sorry, I'm looking at my cat. Um, so <laughs> yeah, There's always animals make appearance in these shows. Um, my wife's going, shh, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so what Charles Davis did, he was he was the executive officer of the 2nd Battalion of the 27th Regiment. You think uh, captain, executive officer, but the battalion commander was a major. Right. So Charles Davis, um, on the 12th of January, the, the main assault, main offensive kicked off on the 10th of January. So their job was to attack up the galloping horse. So I guess if your viewers turn their head sideways or upside down, you can see the horse there and the horse's head's in 53. And it looks like a horse galloping. Yeah, I guess if you look at something long enough, you can make it appear that way. <laughs> With <laughs> enough alcohol, really. anything looks like anything. Yeah, yeah. Flip it around. Um, so then they kept referring to things, the hind legs and the front legs. So what um, the first battalion went up, if you go to my, my, my page, I got one called the Charles Davis um, uh, Medal of Honor and this is one of the most perfect reserve battlefields on Guadalcanal because it's very isolated. And you can see there and I had a friend, we'd put a drone up and then I annotated it and put the, the things on it. So just leave it there for a minute, would you? Yep. So what what they had to do, I won't go in the whole battle of the, the galloping horse. So Charles Davis, on the first day of the attack, he was back with the battalion commander. Battalion commander says, no, you can't go up. He just, he's chomping it a bit. Let me up, let me up, you know, throw me in coach, throw me in. So he, he said, I got some messages because one of the um, companies was, was getting hit quite hard. He goes, I can run a messages up. He goes, okay, run a message up, but come back. So you know what Davis did. He ran the message up. He never came back. So Davis went up and the Japanese and most of the positions of Guadalcanal had reverse slope positions. So I don't know if some of your viewers are familiar with reverse slope positions. Mm -hmm. You can't really engage the position from the you can't shoot direct fire on it. So basically what the reverse slope is, you build your positions on the back of a slope. Yeah, you have limited amount of uh, your vision of, of fields of fire, which can't be directly engaged. And then when the attackers attack, they come up on the, the top of the hill and they're silhouetted and they don't see you and you're almost hitting a point blank. So it's a hard uh, nut to crack a lot. It's especially if it's got mutually supporting uh, bunkers yeah. and they had mutually supporting bunkers here. There was a, the uh, coconut log bunker complex of three. And if you see my red circle there and it was on the reverse slope uh, on the Northern or sorry, on the Northern side, which is the, the top of the photo, you got Hill 52 and Exton Ridge. So that was where the, the army was. And, and then you had another at Sims Ridge where the blue lines they'd moved up to there. So they they had got stuck. So on the first day Davis went up, he went on the other side of the Ridge. And they were trying to find where this bunker complex was. So him, a lieutenant named Sims, and another soldier went to the Carl Ledge. And he looked up over the Carl Ledge to identify where this bunker complex was. And machine gun burst came and killed Sims. Hence, that's why it's called Sims Ridge to this day. And so they identified where the bunkers was. Davis moved back, and he was started calling in 81 mortar fire, trying to hit them bunkers. Anyway, when night fell, he's moved back. He's gave his report to battalion commander. So the next day, battalion commander said, this is what we'll do. We'll all personally lead the company. And that's the E-227 there. And I'll get on that uh, car ledge. Davis, you take four men. You move around on your stomachs to the west side. You get within 10 um, yards of the bunker complex. You throw hand grenades. You start to distract them blow your whistle and your whistle will be the indication that I'll take the whole company and I'll personally lead them over the top of the ridge and we'll hit the Japanese um, from the rear sort of, or from the front, but when they got their attention on you. So Hill 52 in the top, you had the division commander, Joe Collins was on that hill there. And he was, he was actually calling in uh, 81 millimeter mortar fire himself. So he just wow. got personally involved. So he's that close division commander every, and, when you go to the top of this hill, you're silhouetted. You, you, everyone can see you from miles away in the, in the bottom. So what Sims did, he moved up with his men. Oh, sorry, Davis had moved up with his men. He got within 10 yards of the bunker. Eight grenades. He threw eight grenades. And it's quite documented what happened. Japanese threw a few back. One exploded. The other ones didn't. So that was a signal. Davis jumped up, um, started engaging with his M1 Grand. And he had a stoppage, pulled his pistol out, shot a Japanese, and, and they just started attacking. He's blowing his whistle. And instead of just distracting him and his four men, just kept pushing through. 
And when he got in, in everyone was seeing what he was doing. So that inspired the the other company. Then they come over and then they just ran straight up the that, that ridge all the way to Hill 53. They call it the horse's head. All the way to 53 at the top there on the right hand side. Um, now I'll just read you something. So you didn't have to remind me. I said remind me, but I'll read you something that that let me read it here that Collins said after the battle. So Collins walked from Hill 52 there and he met the rest of the guys when they've taken a position. So he went to speak to the battalion commander. As he led this charge, he's calls him Major Davis because he was promoted soon after this. As he led the charge, Major Davis was silhouetted against the sky in clear view of the bulk of the battalion as well as the, of the Japanese. His action had an electri uh, uh, electrifying effect on the battalion. I should warm my glasses. The two companies came to life and in short order had cleared Sims Ridge and was storming Hill 53, which is the right-hand side there, and the horse's head, the Corps' objective for the day. A half hour later, Colonel McCullough and I walked forward from Hill 52 to congratulate Colonel Mitchell on the success of his battalion. We found him up on Sims Ridge, surrounded by exultant soldiers. But when I shook his hand and congratulated him, he replied with tears in his eyes, like the splendid officer and gentleman that he is, sir, it was not me. It was Davis and his men, and the men around him echoed that sentiment. Colonel Mitchell had himself done a grand job, but there was no question that Major Davis's dramatic charge was the decisive factor. I have recommended him for the Medal of Honor and hopes he gets it. And that was wow. Corps Commander. Well, that was later Corps Commander. That was Lightning Joe Collins who witnessed it, and, and a number of people witnessed his charge. So if you in the thin red line, if you go back and see John Cusack, you'll see that they charge a bunker. He blows a whistle. I'll give you a little side note here, and this is, it was almost like a surreal moment. The, one of the first times I ever went up there, 2009. I'm tracing um, Davis and his men. I'm all crawling on my belly. I'm doing everything that, because they're very um, documented quite well. And you could see where the bunker complex was. It's just big holes in the ground. So I'm crawling, crawling, and uh, I get within 10 yards. I come to a little ledge, and I said, okay, here, Davis and his four men pulled the grenades, they threw through the grenades and they charge. And from time to time, that place is burned off. And when I was up there, that we had been burned because locals burn it sometimes for gardens and things. So I'm up there and I'm, I'm laying on my belly, same as him. I'm simulating throwing my grenade. And I look around to my right and there's grenade pool pins, rusty grenade pool pins all around me. And I'm thinking, hold on a minute. Wow. And, and I knew. Because Guadalcanal was a major logistical training base after the campaign was over. And I said, well, I know I got all the range training mounts. No one's ever trained. This wasn't on a train. It's so far away. There was no more fighting there ever. There's no more fighting before. And I went, wow, this is, this is, this is unreal. And um, wow. But probably to this day, something tells me you won't find them there. I, I don't know. They just probably went missing. But something tells me the, those grenade pins are no longer there. You're not wow. supposed to remove things from the battlefield. That I can probably say they good chance they're probably not there anymore. But um, yeah, that was a big surreal moment. I was like, this is this is crazy. So. That is that is an amazing moment. And um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, yeah. And I'm with anyone, there's David O'Keefe is watching this. Anyone, you know, he's written about the Black Watch and Norman, the other units. That anybody who's been writing or researching it, and you're there and you're following the footsteps. I think we've all had those little moments where you're thinking, I'm looking at the same things that guy was looking at x number of years ago this must be exactly what he could see i'm behind the same tree or the same wall it's that, that that's that's the beauty of visiting battlefields folks it's uh, you can you can get a lot from reading people's books but there's something about being there and again a good plug for dave's channel there if you haven't gone out and find walking a battlefield guadalcanal then go and go and search it there but we've got a couple of questions for you dave specifically about this so the first one is from um Scott Grimber. Now you said about these particular coconut log bunkers not being there, but are there any Japanese coconut log bunkers left on Guadalcanal? Oh uh, no, not the. You can imagine they're the coconuts. It's been eighty-one years, so they're, they're well and truly rotted. I imagine if in archaeology, if they was a dig down in some of the things, you could see remnants of of the logs, but right. there's no, no structures there. But there's definitely the the bunker holes, same as the marine bunker holes all over the place, and they were coconut logged um, enclosures, but yeah, you won't see that. 
and and from um, Phil there, how wide a distance does that photo there cover? So from the, from the from the hill over to the mm. right there, what what we what sort of distance we're we looking at there? So from, I don't know how clear the viewers can see that, but then where it says, say hill fifty three to the yep. right, the top of it there to Exton Ridge, which is to the left, um, top. You, you go eleven o'clock from hill uh, fifty three. Yep. That's about two thousand. If that yards, okay. maybe fifteen hundred yards. Okay, thanks so, for that. Yeah. So, um, and we've got a couple of photos. These are your photos from the location there. So, you know, you've talked about before. We've talked about kunai grass. We've talked about jungle, and we've talked about the fact that this is the location that's ever, ever changing. Each time you visit, little bits have been cleared and grown because that's what that's what places like this do, isn't it? But the just run us through roughly what the terrain would have been on that ridge. Just what we're seeing in that photo, pretty much. As you see it. As you see, because yep. all the the coke, all the um the coral ridges are barren, and you can see the thick jungle. Now, what you're looking at there, straight ahead, that little knoll, is yep. Hill 53, yeah. And and right in the forefront, you I don't know if you can hardly see it, but there looks like there's dark depressions. Yeah, that's the bunker complex, from reverse slope. So that's what that's what Davis. So you're standing in, that's looking at the Mill of Honor site right there. Right. That's all you were not. Yeah, so now you're looking at what um, Davis looked at crawling up, him and his men. That's the coral ledge. Now, this was the, this is the first day that Davis crawled up. This is on the east side. So this is where he had E Company was was up against this coral slope, and Davis was on the other side. And the first day when I mentioned him, Sims, and the other soldier crawled up, look over the ledge, that's where Sims was killed right there on that ledge. It's, it's very clear that that coral ledge sticks out. Mm. And I included that photo that uh, because it's got Lawton Collins and Davis in it there, and that's that's a pretty famous photo. But unfortunately, a lot of versions of that they 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 just leave um, uh, Collins in and crop out the other people, which is a shame, really, because it's that. I think that photo conveys that ability he had to 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 get on with junior commanders, because there are some. I know he's not a core commander at this point; now he's the but. There are some commanders that have that detachment from people below them, but I think Collins always, the further up the ladder he went, he still had the ability to to get on with lieutenants and captains and majors, and I think you can see it in that photo there. Yep, exactly. And I'm surprised he didn't take Davis with him to Europe. So as a, I wonder, like a fly on the wall there. So normally they, the generals take their some of their guys with them everywhere they go. But um, yeah, we'll continue on if you want, Woody. Um, a few yeah, more. we'll just show you the photos of Davis again. There. So, who do you yeah. want to go? Do we have Casamento next, or Page, or Monroe? Who do you want? Where do you want to go? We'll go. We'll go to Casamento. Someone else, probably someone you've probably never heard of. Brilliant. We'll do that. So, I hope you're enjoying this, folks. I think you are. So, Corporal Anthony Casamento. So, um, so this is Marine Corps this time, but um, but yes. another lesser known one. I'll tell you another side note here about Guadalcanal Medal of Honors. All the enlisted. So it's five of them. All the enlisted land Medal of Honors on Guadalcanal were all machine gunners. All the machine machine gunners. It shows you the defensive nature of the campaign. So I, I think, as the viewers already know tonight, we're only concentrating on the land uh, yeah. Medal of Honor. There were 20 Medal of Honors um, throughout the whole campaign. There were five Air Medal of Honors in five Navy, 10 land. There's one hybrid, as I call it, Monroe. He, he was in support of a land operation, but it actually happened at sea. Um, so Anthony Casmetto, so actually was awarded, I wouldn't say awarded, um, I'll get in trouble saying awarded, but he was he was presented his Medal of Honor in 1980. So, you know, almost 40 years after the fact. So during his time in the war, he had an officer had to witness a Medal of Honor incident. So in Casmetto's case, the officer was dead and there was no other officers to witness it. There was, and then he actually, when he did his action, which I'll speak to it about in a second, he was, I think given a silver star or recommended for a lower one. He was never given, he was recommended for one, but it was never presented to him. So once again, he was badly wounded and he just, he just wanted to go home. He didn't really fuss about it too much after the war. And then I think the family and a few other Marines and, and people got involved and said, look, you did a great thing. And but they said, well, we don't have an officer witness. And I think years later, you have three Marines come up. One was an officer, and I've read their wit witness account. They presented for this Medal of Honor um, investigation. So that um, came up later. It's a big campaign. 
And then uh, Jimmy Carter, the president, presented it to him in 1980. So you can see this is probably right after it was presented because he, he died a few years after this. So Casamento, once again, like I said, he was a machine gunner. Uh, Corporal Casamento is a machine gunner in the 1st Battalion of the 5th Marines. Um, my old unit, I was in the 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, many, many, many years ago. So um, I really study these guys. So they, they had a bad day on the 1st of November. 1942. So after the, the Battle of Henderson Field in late October, the Japanese division was basically, the second Sendai division was basically smashed. And they were on the, the retreating on the back step. So when's the best time to do a counterattack? Right when, you know, they've got hit pretty hard. So that's what Vandegrift wanted to do. So throughout the whole campaign, he wanted to push the Japanese past the Matanikau River. I think I might have mentioned this in another episode. Um, the most intense and prolonged fighting in the whole Guadalcanal campaign happened around the Matanico, between the Matanico River and the Point Cruz area. A lot of people who think about Guadalcanal and land, or even tourists, they go there, they go, oh, we see Bloody Ridge, and then we see Alligator Creek, and that was it. And, and the, the, the campaign ended. Those two campaigns, it ended, and Marines left, and everyone, everyone was good. But the most, that was the most strategic part of the whole campaign was the Matanikau River. So the Marines always trying to push the Japanese past it to a place called Kukumbona, which is about three miles past it. They wanted to give them breathing space to secure that airfield to, um, because that was the most strategic area, that airfield. So Vandegrift had a chance. The Japanese are on the back foot. Let's push through with a, a massive uh, assault. Um, so on the 1st of November, three engineer bridges went up. They crossed Matanikau, the 5th Marines, and then you had the, the, the 3rd uh, Battalion, the 2nd Marines, the Whaling Group, they called it. Um, so they were going to do a major push, push the Japanese back. So they, they're doing quite well, and they hit a place at the base of, um, it's a natural choke point at the base of um, Point Cruz, Hill 78. So anyone that goes to Haneari today, their parliament house is on that hill. So that was the area. Um, so they went through there, and they hit a, Casamento was leading his, Two machine guns. He was a machine gun um, section leader, so he had four machine guns. Yeah, that's that's it. So that's that's probably about four weeks after the battle. Right. So they're moving. The Marines are moving from the on the way. Looking at here, they're moving from the the right hand side to left hand side. You can see the natural choke point. Um, you can see where Point Cruz comes in. That's the top bit. You really can't see, but there's a ditch. Ridge to the left is Hill 84, and if you to follow the nose of that ditch to the, the sea to the top, there's a, um, a ditch there, and there's a natural defensive line. There's a choke point. The Japanese had that all pinned down. And what they used to do, they used to put the, their machine guns in the bottom of those ravines to fire infilade up and down the ravines. And the Marines, you'll see the coastal track there at the top. That was the only pre-war track they had. So they got to move through that, and the Japanese can infilade them. And then they had their reverse slope defenses on those back of those hills. So Casamento and his squad, they were moving down Hill 78 Ridge from the right to the mechanic house to the far right. So they're moving through there, providing uh, a base of fire. And their objective was roughly where that, uh, a little bit to the left of that red circle. They had a whole infantry company moving on the road to the right. So they were going to move to where that circle is, set up a base of fire. To, so the rest of the... Alpha Company, or sorry, Able Company. I'll get in trouble for using NATO fin, uh, phonetics. It's not Alpha Company. No, okay. Um, a Company, maybe. Um, so they're moving in, and they were supposed to provide cover fire. So they went up, set the guns up, and the lead platoon, roughly about five or ten feet away, hit camouflaged Japanese pillboxes and, and just run into a bus saw. And the Japanese 70 millimeter guns, and they just and 37 millimeter anti tank guns and machine guns, and it pinned them down. And these guys were getting hit hard. So Kazumeto and their guys started getting hit hard too. So he lost. Yeah, I like this photo. That's that's that shows you right there where it was. And um, a lot of see that's a lot happened in that area there. And yeah. I heard a, a a tour guide once of a of American tour company. So all the the, the hotels are in there nowadays. I heard him one time. He said, "Oh, not much happened around here." And I'm just looking out the door, and so I can see the site with three Medal of Honors were, and we're just looking out the window. Um, so Casamento moved there, 
he started taking his squad started taking a lot of fire guys were, were getting shot and killed all around him um so he once again machine gunner he's jumped on the gun by himself and started um providing cover and fire for those marines pinned down below him um, he took out a japanese machine gun um there's a couple of japanese rushes up the hill um there's a a, a painting by a colonel waterhouse a famous marine uh, combat artist did a, a painting of um, Kazumoto. So he's firing away and he's stopping the Japanese and he's actually providing cover fire for the, the rest of the Marines to, to move back with their, with their wounded. So in the process, he shot multiple times, covered with blood, um, and the rest of his squad was killed and wounded. So the B company come up to relieve him. And, and the, I was reading a report of the B company um, captain. He sees all these uh, dead Marines and wounded Marines. He's seen this one Marine, like this figure, he didn't even know it was a Marine, moving around just covered with blood. And he thought, what is that? And, and Kazumoto thought he was about to get shot because they said, oh, they think I'm a Japanese. And he's trying to say, I'm a Marine, Marine. And they, oh, my God. And they grabbed him. And then he was evacuated out. And he spent the rest of the war in hospitals. Um, but, but due to his actions, um, he prevented the rest of them. He uh, prevented the, the Japanese from uh, basically wiping out that company. Very similar to Hall and Fournier, what, what they did mm. with their, um, their actions. Um, so I have a whole episode just on that. And then this is the, this is the ravine. He was up on the left-hand side. The Japanese are up on the right-hand side. Basically where I'm taking his photos where that uh, Marine company was, was pinned down and shot. And where those buildings are, there's a little ditch there. And that was where the Japanese, um, defensive line. If you look straight down the road, um, the Japanese would have their machine guns there and they could fire straight down. Um, the road wasn't there and there's a little trail, I think, but up on that top ridge to the right is where. Um, he was engaging. The Japanese were firing straight, and the Japanese machine guns were up there. And that was the knoll where well, that tall tree is, is where Casameto was. And if you go where the Parliament House is today, it's on Parliament House grounds. Um, that's roughly where it was at. Brilliant and there's style. still 18 Marines from the 1st Battalion, 5th Marines still missing in there. They gave me battlefield burials and had to move out very quickly. Wow. So they're still there. I'll probably never be recovered. Some have been. I've, I've tried. Me and Jeff Raker tried. We're still trying. So. We roughly know where they are. Well, brilliant stuff. So, um, yeah, we're, we're learning a lot. So, uh, Page next or Monroe next? Where do you want to we'll go? go Page, because we covered Mon Monroe's been covered in one of mine. Um, my chesty puller, I covered um, Monroe a bit, but I don't think we've covered Page. So, he's, I won't say Serbian or Croatian, I'll get in trouble. I'll just, what do you, what do you think that, I think he's Serbian. Serbian background. It was, it was Serbian is what I read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I just don't want to make that mistake. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so now this is my opinion only of all the Medal of Honors earned on Guadalcanal on the land. I think Mitchell Page is the most amazing. All of them uh, deserve it. Don't get me wrong, but to me, he had the most amazing action. And he's overshadowed by Basilon. And I'll tell you why. So I'll give you a little background about Page. Page came in 19, um, year did Page come in? 36. So he's a pre war Marine. And when the war started, you know, he'd been a uh, typical pre-war Marine. He'd been to China. I don't think he went to Nicaragua. He'd been to the stateside and naval barracks, and they did some sea duty too. So he had a typical Marine career, but he was a machine gunner. And he had, he was like, when he hit the Guadalcanal, he'd been a machine gunner for like six years or seven years. He knew his he knew his trade. He was professional. Like a lot in the 1st Marine Division, a lot of these old NCOs were professionals and had the good – um, fresh recruits, very motivated young recruits. So that's what made him so, so did so well. But he, um, he was a machine gun section leader with four head machine guns. Once again, machine gunners. Um, so during the uh, October battle of Henderson field, um, the Marines had two four battalions on Matanikau. Like I said, that's a very important. They want to keep the Japanese on the other side of Matanikau because that stage the Japanese had brought their big guns up to hundred um, millimeters and 150 millimeters. The pistol peats they called them and they were allowed and they could hit uh, the airfield and japanese also had some tanks they brought up a 12 tanks of the first independent uh, tank company and they knew that if they had them get them on the um east bank of the metanic house and the platform they could go almost straight to the airfield so he had two far battalions vandergriff did so he had his flanks it's one of his flanks exposed on the left hand side and they knew the japanese had, had done a major holding attack in the battle of henderson field I think it's been covered in your Barcelona episode, mm -hmm. and I covered it on in the Chesty Pulling. But anyway, uh, they pulled 
2nd Battalion of the 7th Marines, which was Page was in, and they put him up on the ridge. Um, and Page, he wrote a good book called A, a Marine Named Mitch. And, it's, and, he, and he's been on, if you can go on YouTube, and he talks about his Medal of Honor. Yeah, um, I've seen it. It's just pretty good, you know, especially when the Japanese, he moved his head and the burst went underneath him. But he, um, he went and set up at night on the first night, and he said he could hear the Japanese blowing. And Page was an all-star baseball pitcher. Um, a bowler for you cricket guys out there. He was, also, he was an all-star. But don't player. say you're not a cricket guy. You've been Australia long enough now. You can't never you get must have succumbed. You must have succumbed. Rugby league, rugby union, yes, but no, I've, I've tried everything with cricket. <laughs> Days, test, mess. Anyway, um, but he he was a good baseball player, so he started throwing grenades, and he says, "I can't throw these grenades with these long sleeves." So the next day. He, he spent two hours, and he goes in my, uh, great detail, taking his, his knife and just cutting his sleeves out so he could throw a grenade faster. So the next night, the Japanese attacked under Colonel Oka. Um, Oka is like a tragic figure in the Guadalcanal campaign. He's always popping up somewhere. But they, they've attacked his positions. Now, Page had his machine guns on the knoll. If you if you go to there today, his knoll, the knoll is, is sticks out there. In fact, Zimmerman here, he's the guy who wrote the book after the war. His drawing's a little bit off because you go to the where those two arrows are, Page's position is, is on that knoll. See that knoll that sticks out yep. to the right of that? That was his position. And they were sticking out. He said, if you stuck out, well, I won't say exactly what he said. They stuck out a lot, proverbial, so to speak. Um, so they were out there. And he had two rifle companies to both sides. So if you go there to this day, you know that if you walk the ground, there's no way that you can get where that air, those arrows is. You can see the contour line is straight up. The Japanese think of unless they had ropes. So they went to the right. So Page, they get hit. They, they Him and his machine guns, they fight off the first assault. Then the Japanese come for a larger assault. A larger assault, what happens is he kills most of Page's um, men and his machine guns. He's basically left Page by himself with four machine guns. Um, they left uh, Rifle Company, Elf Company, basically retreats. Page was so mad he grabs a 1903 Springfield and takes a shot at the Marines running away. He's so pissed off, he said. So they've, they've retrograded out. So he's left up there by himself. So the Japanese just say some had got behind him. He's on machine gun. He's running from machine gun to machine gun, trying to keep up the fire. So at one stage, he says, I need some help. So his page is in the bottom right there. And then the Japanese attack. Um, he had two positions. So he's two machine guns, had four four machine guns, just like Barcelona had spread out. So what Page did, so F Company is a little bit to the right. So what Page did, he went back to G Company, which is the one on the left, and grabbed a, uh, three privates with another machine gun and said, assist me. So they come up. Um, he sets machine gun up. These guys are trying to run ammo back and forth. Um, they're doing a good job, he said, but all three were wounded. So he's left there again. So he's running from machine gun to machine gun. And during that time, his machine guns was the only one on the whole line going so you can imagine when a machine gun goes off in combat it draws fire because you want to take that machine gun out he said it just seems like all the japanese fire was coming his way but he was he actually was holding that knoll by himself so then at one stage the japanese had got behind him and he knew the battalion command post forward command post and the Connolly there to the top he says well they're gonna they're gonna wipe these guys out so he said the only place that had grazing fire which is what machine gunners shoot is about knees high with a grazing fire because the whole idea is you hit them with grazing fire at the knees, they fall down, then you hit them in the head and then the rest of the body. So that's, and you don't tend to fire high. So he spins around and said, the only place I had grazing fire is behind me up that hill. So he starts firing. So the Marines in the battalion command post thought the Japanese had got Page's guns and they're shooting at us because the bullets are coming around us. But he stops the Japanese there. In fact, the next day when they looked at some of the Japanese, they had bullet holes in the back of their, their legs and in the foot of their, and their, and their um, soles of the shoes when the Page's machine gun has hit them. So they've, they've went back. Page has managed to get a couple of other guys to help him. So Major Connolly at that stage grabbed all the, uh, the clerks, the typist, the radio men, the corpsmen, whatever he had in his command post, and said, let's do a counterattack. So Page is still on that knoll by himself. So they, he sees the Marines coming in a counterattack. He says, he yells to the, the Marines to his right, basically, let's go. So he grabs the 1917 heavy machine gun, 
I think I might have a picture of, or a drawing of him. Yeah. And he runs down the hill leading a counterattack, a bayonet charge counterattack, holding a gun. Now, Page actually fired this gun. Now, Barcelona, I think we discussed before, did not fire his the, the, the gun just like this, even though there's photos or um, statues of him and, and there's all kind of you know, movies of him fired. He did not fire it that way. And Barcelona's own testimony and statement, I think we, you've covered quite well on this channel. But he's ran down, charging, firing it. And he said, because he could speak some Japanese because he'd, he'd served in China and he knew how the Japanese, when he listened to, to them and he knew some of the language, and uh, he yelled out, stand up or get up or something like that at one stage. And he seen some Japanese pop up and he started shooting those guys. And he said one officer, he said he think, thinks it was a colonel, but who knows, um, took his pistol out and tried to challenge him. Then he took his sword out and he said, I shot him at point blank range. Um, but after it didn't take long after that, after they, they, they shot a few Japanese and then he said it just went silent. So, yeah, if you got YouTube guys. Google um, Medal of Honor Page, and you hear his own testimony. Um, now, Page, he didn't like to give – he says, look, it's what happened a lot with Barcelona. He said, if you give it to reporters, um, he says, I want to give my versions to people who appreciate the history. He said, if I give it to others, they will embellish it. They'll make – what do he say? They'll make it gung-ho, is what they said, and, and mm -hmm. blow it out of proportions like we've seen across the board with many of, the, of these – these guys has, has earned it you know you've get a well that that's it's an interesting rabbit hole dave is that medal of honor citations are often not as interesting to read as the account the actual contemporary accounts by people who were there at the time because the medal of honor uh, citations are kind of written by the pr department to make a statement for the public back home so they they tend to kind of crank up the uh, the, the gung ho ness. They 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 simplify the things a bit, and as though they're they're very important. I mean, you can't and folks, you can easily find any of these citations online. Just search yeah, these names, and you'll find them all listed. But they're they're not necessarily the best way to understand the history, are they? Yeah, they don't sell papers either. No, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, I didn't. I don't sell it. It's just add this to it and add this, embellish it a bit. Um, and and you don't need to embellish what these guys did. It's just it's just amazing. Um, so why does Page, you don't hear Page, and why does Barcelona overshadow Page? Now, Page, Barcelona earned his medal between the 24th and 25th of October, the night of. This action happened between the 25th and 26th, about five miles away. Sometimes you read accounts that Page was on Bloody Ridge. Page wasn't, he's five miles away from Bloody Ridge. Same battle, Battle of, of Henderson Field, which happened over – probably about a seven or eight mile from, from a crow's flies area because there was three separate Japanese assaults um, uh, throughout throughout the, the one battle over a number of days. So now you'll notice in this photo here, this was taken in, in uh, Balmoral Oval outside of Melbourne, Australia. So it's called Citation Oval to this day. So it's a famous photo, and it shows all the, the Medal of Honor, the guys that show – it shows Vandegrift, Edson, um, Page and Barcelona all standing together. There it is. So you'll notice I mentioned um, Page was a platoon sergeant. In his photo, you, if you look closely, you'll see a little lieutenant's bar on his, on his cap and on his epaulette. So he's an officer here. So he was given a battlefield promotion um, in December 42. Barcelona was offered a battlefield promotion. He was offered a promotion to an officer twice in his career, and he really knocked it back both times. So Barcelona could have been also here too. And um, now my reason is behind why Barcelona was, or Page was old shadow of Barcelona. Barcelona was a single a Marine, young, good looking fella, um, enlisted Marine. At this stage, um, you had Page, older guy, married, officer. Now, Barcelona was the first and enlisted even though there's a guy in the second Raiders who earned it posthumously um but the he was the first living enlisted marine so what can we do with him we can sell war bonds we can take him back we can we can put him on a, a rock show tour you know we can we can make him a, a, a mega star a rock star and that's what they did um unfortunately but that's what they had to do at the time so that's why he is obviously um or pages old shadow by Barcelona. 
that's my theory and that's supported by a number of people and it, 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 makes, it, it makes absolute yeah. sense doesn't it and, and i'd even mm. question that even page's serbian background re- brings up a slightly complicated yeah. subject that maybe the press didn't want to get into because this is right in the era when the the, the americans and british are deciding which which kind of horse the back in yugoslavia and serbia and so maybe even that just adds a level of of complication to something so whereas as you said there Baslone is is the is the typical perfect for press, you know, gung ho, young marine, good looking to enlist, and again enlisted. But the other thing about that photo that's always struck me is I have the feeling those jackets were given to them like five minutes earlier. They don't look like they fit them. That, that, mm. I, that I mean, that it's just it's just weird. I mean, I'm, I'm no, used maybe. Victoria Cross photos when they've got tailor. There's something odd about those uniforms. I will tell you, you know why? They're Australian oh. battle jackets. Because when they come out of Guadalcanal, they didn't have any uniforms. And yeah. except for the, the major general there, he's in his nice, we call them alphas, uh, class yeah, yeah, A's. Yeah. Yeah. Class A. So you can see that's nice tailored because still to this day, all the Marine uniforms are tailored. You can see that. You look at the other ones, um, look like potato sacks, is, is what old Sergeant yeah. Major used to say. But that's what they were. They, and they later turned out to be the Vandergriff jackets, patterned after Ike jackets, but they're Australian battle dress jackets. Now you'll see some photos of the first Marine Division, and, and they're wearing their jackets with the with the um, blue diamond, with the Guadalcanal, because they were it's what they were given. And you'll see a lot of photos of them wearing those around Melbourne and and in uh, Victoria, in the R and R. But they had these Australian battle jackets. That's all the uniforms they had. That makes sense now. There we are. So, um, well, yeah, and again, the page story. I mean, we, yeah, again, we can find out more about it online. But we've got a couple more to go. So, do you want to go to yep. uh, Bailey next, and uh, and Edson, or or um, or back to Monroe? What do you want to do? We'll go to Monroe real quick. Um, now, Monroe, if you really want to, um, I've got some more data on Monroe and on on your channel. So, if you go back to the Chesty Puller episode, because yep. obviously. Uh, Chesty Puller was was big in this incident with, with Monroe. So I'll cover Monroe very quickly. So Monroe was a he's the only uh, U.S. Coast Guard to earn a Medal of Honor, still to this day in, in history, and all the Coast Guard guys know him. They have a ceremony they used to every year, the Coast Guard. In fact, the USS Monroe was there, the new one. There's been a several. I mean, I was there one time they came in, and they do a ceremony every year, the Coast Guard, at Point Cruz, and there's a little monument to him at Point Cruz. In the Point Cruz Yacht Club. So it wasn't an exact place it happens, but I was told, I said, why is a monument in a yacht club when it happened two or 300 meters away? There, that's in a yacht club. They said, well, it's the only place we could keep it safe. You know, if they put it somewhere else, and unfortunately, like a lot of places yeah. on Guadalcanal, they'd, not that the locals are disrespected, it's a third world country. They'd just grab it and melt it down and, and use it for scrap metal to make money. Um, so yeah, it's kept safe there. So that's actually at the site. We're about two or three hundred meters away off the coast. So Monroe, um, yeah, you can probably leave it there, Woody. Um, so the second battle of Botanical, the only um, defeat the Marines had during the campaign, and we discussed it in length uh, with a Chesty Puller um, episode. So Monroe, so basically what the Marines were going to do, they were going to, they had the Japanese there in a pocket on the left side of the, the, the river, the top left, and what they were going to do it was a, basically a, a plan on the fly by uh, Twining. He was the operations officer for the 1st Marine Division. And he had Edson then. Edson was the 5th Marine Division, or sorry, the 5th uh, Marine Regimental Commander. He'd been promoted from the 1st Raiders. And he had Puller there. So uh, they tried to push across and with a holding attack and go go across the mouth of Matanical, the Marines. They had to re- the Raiders were going to go upstream and cross at the Nippon or One Log Bridge. You know, I think as someone said, as Rich Frank, um, who wrote the great Guadalcanal definitive book, says it's a one log bridge because it was one log. I think um, I had a friend that said that once. Um, um, so they were going to cross up there. Then once they cross, the plan was uh, the rest of the 1st Battalion, 7 Marines, was back at the Lunga perimeter. That was going to be the indication for them, the trigger for them to do a, a, an amphibious assault to the rear. Then you'd have surrounded the Japanese and crush them. But um, there was a major bombardment or a major air raid at the when all this was happening back at the airfield. It uh, disrupted command and control. The raiders had, actually got stopped the first time in ever, the only time in the, really the history, stopped hard. Um, and they didn't get across the river, but the division thought they were across the river. Hence, 
that was the trigger to launch the amphibious assault. So amphibious assault launched, they hit behind the lines, and they went up on Hill 84, and they got trapped. And they took off their white T-shirts, and, and in the haste of it, they've left the radio. Man, I know it's almost a comedy area. They've left the radio. They put the white T-shirts out on the ridge at 84, Hill 84 there, Lankiki Ridge uh, nowadays, and they spelled out help. There's a young lieutenant, SBD um, pilot named Doug Leslie, flying around, and he spotted help. Said, okay, these guys need help. So he radioed it back. Puller spoke to Edson and said, I, my, my battalion's trapped. We need to get them out. And I think Edson was still trying to formulate a plan. Um, wasn't fast enough for Puller. Puller went back to the Lunga boat basin. So this is where we uh, bring in Charles, or sorry, Monroe. So Doug Monroe was in charge of the, the landing craft, and he had dropped the Marines off, and he went back to the Cookham boat basin, which is in the perimeter. So Puller went back. I uh, imagine I think he got in a Jeep, went back and says, let's go. My boys are trapped. Let's go. So Puller went out to the USS Monson. It says USS Ballard there, but that was um, – records nowadays or post-war it's the uss monson was later sunk um in the, the campaign but he's got on the monson and the monson he said let's go and and um monroe and the rest of them they said like ducks and like a big a baby duck and a mama duck and they just follow mm -hmm. each other so they went around and they've landed and they started evacuating the marines out and the monson was throwing in um five inches um and they were communicating to the Monson with sigma sigma floors. It's a, they call the mini Dunkirk, um, or sorry, the little Dunkirk. I've got a whole episode, about two episodes on it actually. I got one on Monroe itself. Uh, here you go in a great detail um, on it, and then I got the little Dunkirk. Um, <clears throat> so basically, Monroe, they're getting the Marines out. They had two uh, tank lighters, which is uh, landing craft tanks. They could put like 40, 50 Marines in. They didn't have any tanks in it, but it's a larger one. So one of them became um, stuck on a sandbar. I know exactly what the sandbar is. I covered it in my video. So they had to, they're trying to move that out. They get the Marines out. It started getting under fire and they had infilade fire from Point Cruz. And Monroe, they, I think the other two boats, they hooked a chain to it trying to pull that, that uh, tank ladder off the sandbar. So Monroe put his craft um, in between that tank ladder and the Japanese fire, machine gun fire. So Monroe, the, the, the forward gunner was wounded, was firing the Lewis guns. So Monroe's manned the Lewis gun about 250 yards off and was laying down covering fire. And that's a good, I think it was painting was in the 80s. But that's a good rendition. That's fairly accurate. Um, the train looks quite well. I think, I think he was out a bit further, but like, it, it, it's a good one. Yep. It, it yeah, shows yeah. what was happening. So he's in the Higgins boat there and he's firing from the bow there and with his Lewis gun. And so in the process, they finally got the tank ladder um, free. And roughly when they got the tank ladder free, a, a stream of machine gun bullets came and one struck um, him in the back of the, the neck. I said the head or the neck. And he fell to the bottom of the boat and they were able to evacuate. And then before, before he got down to uh, Cookham, he regained consciousness. And I think uh, Evans, which was his good friend, he said to Evans, uh, did we get him out? A word to that effect. And he goes, yeah, we got him out. And then he went unconscious and he uh, died shortly after that. So he was posthumously um, earned a Medal of Honor. So that's um, – when I first did this, I had the Japanese fourth, but there was a 124th. So add okay. a one, two in there real quick. No <laughs> we don't see yeah, that. We'll, 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 we'll do that next time. Oh. But yeah, and, and it's a great story, isn't it? And it to me, the Monroe Medal of Honor is one of those ones that absolutely that's what Medal of Honors are for. And I've always said it. If you have to question whether or not an action is worth the Medal of Honor, it probably isn't. Because the ones that definitely are, you just go, yeah, it's a it's a it's a slam dunk, isn't it? You know, there are various cases people talk about, go, should this guy have received the Medal of Honor or the Victoria Cross? You go, I'm not sure. If, when it really is a certain one, you just read it and go, yep, yeah, no, definitely. There's there's, yeah. there's something about a proper Medal of Honor that you just go, yep, every day of the week. Yeah, his life. Yeah, absolutely. Just, just keep on the photo. We'll go back to Casametto. You can really see there. Now, Casametto, this is the same area where Casametto are in his. So you'll see that uh, where I've got 1-7 there on 84 where they're coming off. That's where the Japanese defenses were in 1 November. And Casametto was on the left-hand side. 
So that's where all that that uh, uh, action occurred, right there. Um, and this was probably about a month later. So that's how it looked during the actual battle. Mm. You can see how the Japanese uh, had those good defenses there. All right. Yeah, stuff. Um, all right. Who have we got? Bailey, Bailey? and Edson, I guess. Next. Edson. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I covered you – now. you go back to my the first Marine Raiders and other units. Um, I think on the first show I did with you, we yeah. go into quite a detail on these two. So once again, you, the viewers can and, and go there and get a more detailed account. Um, Bailey's one of my favorite Guadalcanal personas, so to speak. So Bailey, he was a pre-war uh, Marine. A lot of these guys were pre-war, especially uh, the senior officers and NCOs. Um, so Bailey was kind of like a larger-than-life figure. He was about six foot three. Um, great athlete, great leader of men, smart as hell. You know, it's everything you can think of. Um, very brave man. So he led C Company of the First Raiders. So Edson surrounded himself with some real good officers. He hand picked them. So basically, all Edson officers were real good, were real great. You know, he didn't he didn't suffer fools, so to speak. So even on on Tulagi in the first action, Bailey was the one who uh, jumped onto the Japanese uh, bunker, pulling the sandbags off, and and shooting the Japanese in in the bunker when they, they actually shot him in the leg, and he was um earned a silver star for that. He was evacuated back to New Caledonia. He became a bit of a celebrity when it, New Caledonia because he started um, giving talks to the U.S. Army about the fighting on Guadalcanal. So him and another officer kind of hitched a ride. They wasn't supposed to leave the um, the um, hospital. The typical, I want to get back to my men. So they, they got a ride back, flew in a, a bird because at that stage they had the airfield going. They used to fly out um, R4Ds which is a Navy Marine Corps version of what the C-47, I think. Yeah, yeah, so the cargo planes. So they, they were flying guys, um, flying um, supplies in and taking um, wounded out. So he flew in, and then he joined him on the second day of the Battle of Bloody Ridge. So he comes up, still wearing his – he didn't have his boots because he kind of checked himself out of the hospital, and he had hospital tennis shoes on apparently. <clears throat> and – He's, he's came up, reported into Edson. He says, I'm here. And Edson said, oh, thank goodness we need you. So his company had been overran on the first night, C Company. So he goes, I'm not sending you back to C Company. You stay here with me on the command post. You can help me out. So the <clears throat> the night of the um, 13th and 14th which is, was the um, – it happened over two nights at Bloody Ridge. So the 13th and 14th was the – the main of Japanese assault and it ended up with the Marines around the horseshoe shaped perimeter on, on Hill number two, which is um, Edson's command post. And it was kind of like the Alamo. So they'd surrounded horseshoe shape um, and they dug in. It was hand to hand fighting artillery going everywhere. And during the fight, um, Edson and Bailey, what they did was they stood up during the whole fight. They inspired their men. Bailey was shot in the head, slight wound in the head. He's bleeding from the head. So he's still yelling at guys, getting them going. He's running back and forth. He's moving. He's, he's taking hand grenades and he's taking ammunition. And the, the reports after the battle, they said, oh, uh, Major Bailey, he, he was with us. And they said, no, Major Bailey was with us. And the lady said, no, Major Bailey, Major Bailey was with us. So he was moving back and forth through the lines. He was everywhere that night inspiring them in. Wounded. Um, Edson standing on the ridge. Uh, refused to. He only got down a few times. Apparently, he stood on ammo box in the on the in the, some of the worst time of it. Stood up on ammo box and was yelling at the guys. And at one stage, the Marines started. There was a uh, supposedly gas attack. And they started to, to bug out as they called it to, to retrograde because it was getting pretty hard. And he basically was yelling at them and and, and shaming them, um, saying, you know, they, there's one thing that the Japanese have that you don't. They have guts. He says, if you, you know, it's the only thing between us and the airfield is, or only thing between the Japanese and the airfield is us. So if you got to die in your hose, you're going to die. Just die in your hose, but we're not moving. And um, in one stage, he had his 45 out and it, and Bailey, and yeah, it, was, it was, yeah. Well, basically, their inspiration, they held that ridge, um, getting the guys together and rallying the men. 
And um, Edson, he didn't get wounded, but he had a few nicks in his clothing, and I think his canteen was shot, and his bullets were going, and guys were getting shot and killed all around him. And Bailey was slightly wounded. But due to their um, inspiration and their leadership, um, the uh, the Marines held, and the artillery, obviously, is a major major factor, but the Marines held. And, and due to that, uh, Edson and Bailey were both um, nominated for the Medal of Honor. Now, Edson, as we've seen in the photo, he received his back in Australia. Now, where was Bailey? Fortunately, about two weeks later, Bailey was killed on the Matanikau River. And, you know, we went back to Monroe, and we were showing the, the attack that the Raiders was trying to cross the One Log Bridge. Um, Bailey was the executive officer, and, and Lieutenant Colonel Griffin was the commander because um, Edson had moved on to the 5th Marine Regiment. So they got to the uh, One Log Bridge area. <clears throat> Japanese had pushed a, a reinforced platoon across. And they were trying to, to get to the bridge when a machine gun, uh, apparently Bailey was on his knees and he was looking over um, a tree or a log. And a machine gun burst caught him in the face and the chest and killed him instantly. Um, and then Samuel Griffin, the battalion commander, came up. And they said, where's Bailey? Good friends. And he says, he's dead. And, and Griffin became so... Um, all right. He says, we need to flank these guys. And if you go there to this day on Hill 65, it's just straight up cliff. So he tried to move one to the left and, and then Griffin was shot in his shoulder. Griffin actually later wrote a book um, on Guadalcanal. I have a couple of books here. It's there. It's right behind me. Um, but yeah, it's a good book to read too. He, he wrote it um, after that. Brilliant. So, And we've got a couple more photos of that's the ridge after the battle, isn't it? Yep, that's the ridge after the battle. And once Coral Ridge, once again, they didn't have – they had a few strands of barbed wire, and they didn't have hardly any digging. in trench. And that's that's the day after. And this was on the area where Edson mm. earned yeah, – That's a great story, great story. Yeah, and then we got another contemporary photo of yours, I guess. Yeah, that's hill number one. So that's the first hill. And what Edson did on the first night, and I, I think I explained it more in the, the other video, or, um, video we made, or the other episode – so he moved his guys back because the Japanese had that right flank, the, the Lingua Rivers to the right. The Japanese had penetrated through there the first night. And he says, if they penetrate again with their other two battalions, he probably thought they had, they'll cut my guys in half. So he pulled his units off that front hill, um, pulled them back about 200, 300 yards, opened up a clear field of fire. So this is this is General Holcomb, who's the com commandant of the Marine Corps, which is the, the head of the Marine Corps. He's on the left. The guy on the right is uh, Major General Vandegrift, the division commander, and the guy in the middle is Lieutenant Colonel Edson, or Colonel Edson, sorry, he's a colonel. And they're standing on the exact spot um, where he earned it. That's hill number uh, two, the Edson's command post. So this is in the, the trip in October when the commandant came out. So Edson's explaining the battle to him. There. Right. Brilliant. Well, it's been brilliant stuff. We got, we're going to just, because we have to include Bazalone, um, but yes. we've done a whole episode on him and with, with Brian Dimitrovich, and you've mentioned him as well. But you know, we might, we, we for the sake of completing the ground actions, we will we will run through it again and maybe give some more insight about things you've learned about this action as well. So, um, Bazalone, we've, we've, we've referenced him already. What, what what have you got to add today? Well, Bazalone, I've I've probably haven't studied this person as much on a Medal of Honor as I studied Bazalone. Um, like I said before, I think my, my other episodes, I first went to Guadalcanal in 2009 for short trips, and then 2018 to 2020, I got to stay there for two whole years when I was deployed there. And in my free time, I just researched. And the area where Barcelona earned his Medal of Honor, there was a couple of areas. Um, it's very thick, swamp jungle, swampy jungle. And I've done a lot of research in there, and I probably visited that area more than any non-local I can, I can think of. And In fact, I can honestly say I have. And I used to uh, walk it back and forth, studying the bunker positions. I've got all the patrol maps. I got all the overlays. I've got all the. Um, I've spoken to about four or five veterans who was actually there. Um, one was actually right beside Barcelona. Um, uh, there's a lot of. I think we discussed it uh, just early around with Page. There's a lot of misconceptions. Um, um, I guess things that get probably um, taught that didn't really occur, um, overblown. Um, don't get me wrong, Bassler, what he did was very amazing, and he more than more than earned a medal. And Bassler is a very humble guy. So I have 
you know, direct testimony by Barcelona. I have his actually testimony in the Medal of Honor. I have his testimony he gave to the Marine History um, um, section to officers who were basically conducting like a police interview. They're really drilling down mm. um, on what happened. So basically, Barcelona, he was a, a born in Buffalo. He was a, um, a pre war guy too. He was in the Army for, I think, three years in the 31st Infantry in the, in the um, Philippines. That's why he became Manila John. They call him Manila John from the Marines because they always talk about his Manila days. Um, uh, he was a machine gunner, heavy machine gunner. He didn't go to boot camp, Marine Corps boot camp. So he, he got out, I think became a truck driver and a few odd you know, jobs, and he wanted to go back to the, the Far East. And he says, well, the Marines are going to Far East. Well, they go to China or Philippines and will join the Marines. And they said, what can he do? He goes, I'm a machine gunner. So I have all the evidence that he, he enlisted. He signed up in Philadelphia. Right. And the next day he was in Quantico and that's where the fifth Marines was. And I hear some guys out there saying, hold on a minute. Bassano was in the seventh Marines. What's this? Get this guy off your show. What do you don't know what he's talking about? He was in the fifth Marines initially. They were stationed at Quantico because in those days, the first Marine division was on the East coast and the second division was on the West coast. So he was in the, the uh, fifth Marines for a while as a machine gunner. And then when the seventh Marines formed, cause they wouldn't form yet. Um, he went over to the seventh Marines with a lot of um, uh, veterans and um, a lot of uh, old hands to speak. So he's machine gunner there. And he picked up Sergeant quite quickly. So the war started in seventh Marines. They sent him to Samoa. They were in Samoa. Um, so they didn't land on Guadalcanal. And I've heard guys say, well, Barcelona was there on Guadalcanal. And I know he, he landed on the 18th of September with the seventh Marines and the first big resupply. Um, the, the biggest battle he fought in was um, this one, the battle of Henderson field. And Barcelona said, if all, it's a Medal of Honor action, Barcelona actually said the most exciting time he had on was at Coley Point, which happened two weeks after this battle. It was quite amazing. Anyway, Barcelona was in here. He was covering an area called the Sector 3 Trail, which is a vital trail in the middle of the Marine lines. So he had uh, a machine gun section of four heavy, four heavy machine guns. That's another thing you hear sometimes. You hear about Barcelona had two machine guns, but his Medal of Honor citation says two sections. The right. section was, was two squads with four machine guns. So he had them in two bunkers. And um, he had about 30 uh, bunkers. Uh, Barcelona said about 30 feet away from each other. Two bunkers, two machine guns, and two, both bunkers. So the Japanese were coming, and he was covering that um, vital trail with his four machine guns. And it was a 37-millimeter um, anti-tank gun covering that track, too, not too far from Barcelona. I mean, you won't see it in the HBO Pacific series or anything else. But they're covering that. that so Barcelona had a lot of guys around him. had a whole battalion. So they come through, Barcelona's in the left-hand bunker. They hit uh, A Company, which is roughly where the left arrow is. Um, so he started supporting a, some of his guns, started supporting that attack. So the Japanese were attacking up those trails. They were attacking about company size, platoon to company size. So um, a little after the, the midnight on the 25th, the rain had stopped. They were on the field phone line. They're coming in, they're coming in. So they started hitting Barcelona's bunkers on the left-hand side. He was on the left-hand side. And during the, sometime during the action, they had a runner come over. and says, look, our right bunker has been taken out. So what Barcelona did, he grabbed the, the machine gun, heavy machine gun, 1917, with a tripod attached. So some people don't think it was a tripod. He, his own testimony and his other testimony, he has a tripod. Because why is Barcelona going to take a machine gun, machine gun without a tripod, knowing the other yeah. bunker has been blasted? So he takes me and he has to go back because they had a uh, 50 yards back. They had a supply trail. So what they did, he had to go, he had to run about 30 yards to the supply trail, run 30 yards down, then 30 yards back in like a dog leg. So him and two other guys took off and he said between there and the other bunker, they ran into six Japanese and we took care of them. That's all he said. So I think some people take artistic license at that stage and said he took his machine gun and fired it. But he said he had it spread an eagle on his back. And he didn't have a machete. He had a um, Colt 45 with him. So they make it to the other bunker. And he says he gets there, and there's um, there's two guys. I won't mention the names, but there's two guys. One's the Evans, and, and um, they're sitting and they're firing. He said, and they're the most bravest guys you ever know. And they're just firing and yelling at the top of their lungs. They wouldn't shoot machine guns, shooting rifles. And he, he said the dead and wounded had already been taken out. So he says he lays his gun down about two feet away from the bunker. He says, and then I roll into the other bunker. This, and they said the gun's been busted. So one gun was was out. He said the other gun had a, a stoppage. So he 
cleared it real quick and got it going. So he used, he fired that. He'd roll two feet over, load, fire the other one. He kept going back and forth, back and forth. And he kept that up. And the Japanese were rushing, like, they'd rush in 20 guys, 30 guys, or 40 guys. He'd fire, then he'd stop. He'd fire and he'd stop. And sometime during that, he had to go back and get ammunition. What's a, this is the most amazing thing about his action. During all this time, you got Japanese who infiltrating through. They're running through left and right. You got thousands of Japanese behind him. He's got hundreds by, or in front of him. He's got probably hundreds behind him. He's got Marines on left and right firing full bore. Instead of running straight back because he needs some Japanese behind him, he runs out in front where the barbed wire is, runs down the line in front of all the Marines to run back in. And he's running, he's barefooted. And the reason he's barefooted because if you go to that, that area today, it's just all thick, swampy, nasty jungle. So if you got your boondockers, as they called them in those days, they're very yep. slick. And the that's why the locals are all barefooted because they can get good traction. So he just threw them off and he's running barefooted through there. And he, he, he said he was barefooted. There's accounts that he was barefooted. So he goes back about 150 yards. I know where the, the ammo point was, and he grabs um, a number of, of boxes ammo. He, he didn't bring links because he got to run through mud. He's a good professional machine gunner, so he's, he's boxes. And he said he'd, when he get to the clearance, he'd drag them, then he'd get in the jungle and run. So when he gets back, um, the guys hadn't fired any machine gun, and he gets it going, and he's firing again. And I remember at one stage when the officers asked him, they said, well, did you run completely out of ammunition before you went back? He said, no, I left four belts. They said, well, why'd you do that? He goes, just in case I need to fire some more rounds. And you could just see him probably thinking, that's a dumb question. But he kept he kept firing all through the, the night. And it wasn't continuous. They said he said it'd go an hour, then it'd be a rush. Or then he'd go 30 minutes, it'd be a rush. And that makes sense. Yeah. And he said at one stage, you know, in the Pacific series, I have him running out or getting someone to run out and moving bodies from the wire. That never happened. Um, bodies did stack up because the wire was only 30 feet. He said the wire was 30 feet from him. He could see 20 feet on the other side. That's the only field of fire he had. And they were stacking up. So what he did, he just moved his gun left and right. Because think about it, he's a professional machine gunner. The Japanese are there. Why is he going to run out or get his men to, to run out into the danger area where the Japanese are and start pulling Japanese off the wire? You'll just move your gun around to get a clear yeah, field of fire. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's what he did. Um, and when morning time came, um, at that stage, before morning time, the the – 3rd Battalion and 164th, the Army guys are being dropped in each hole. And um, when the morning time came, Bachelon had his two guys still with him. But you read his accounts, Bachelon was along with only two guys. I mean, he had hundreds of guys left and right. Uh, Bachelon was going three days on a gun. No, he was relieved at 6 that morning. In the 1st Battalion, 7 Marines moved up on top of Bloody Ridge then. Or Bachelon was shooting from a ridge. No, he was in a flat jungle. Bachelon shot the gun from the, the hill. No, <clears throat> he did burn his hands. But that was from changing barrels <clears throat> without the asbestos glove. He, he mentions that. Um, <clears throat> he did fire his 45. He said he had his 45 laying on the ground beside him. And when a Japanese run behind him, they'd yell out, Sarge, you behind him. And he'd reach out. He said, I, I'd shoot a Japanese behind me. And um, there's a good photo of him. Uh, it looks like he was in the States and he's, he's recreating. And he's got it. He's behind a gun. He's got his 45 laying on the ground and he's laying down. And he's fired from a prone position. Yeah, there it is. So that, that was exactly I, I, added, did. I added I added the kind of the color the color kind of image of the of of how these mo these stories grow a little bit with belts ammunition around the neck and stuff you know it's mm. and I was going to ask you later on but it's come up now I mean medal as someone who studied this campaign hugely medal of honor these medal of honor stories are amazing they're inspirational they're 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 fantastic as a as a microcosm of what's going on there but at the same time. They can also give slightly distorted versions of the battles, and also not pay tribute to the people around. You know, in support, it's it, it they're a little bit narrow in focus. So, um, we learned a lot from them. But th my advice to viewers is be be careful in just reading uh, actions of Medal of Honor or Victoria Cross recipients. They don't always give you the the depth of understanding that reading a broader selection of accounts would. Exactly, I agree. Because in Barcelona had guys all left and right. He too, he's a very humble guy. And he says no, I mean, and that's why you see most of the, the Medal of Honor guys. They go, look, this is, this is not about me. It's about this is yeah. from my buddies, and and so that was the Vitals Sector Three Trail. So that's why he what he did was very um, important because if the Japanese had, uh, it's a 
avenue of approach you could see. If they went through there, they would give them you know hundreds of guys down through there. So that was why that area was was highly covered by Barcelona and the rest of these guys. Um, but his his actions actually. He was credited with wiping out basically a company. And that's another thing here. Oh, he wiped out thousands of guys. And no, he didn't. He, he was credited officially wiping out 38 Japanese, killing Japanese, because there was 38 bodies between the barbed wire and his hole, which is about 30. But they just said it's probably a few um, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, almost 100 guys behind him. Because he wiped out a company because uh, Murayama, the Japanese second division commander, had, had stripped his companies down so they could move quicker. So each company was only about a hundred and something guys. So he stripped them down. So he Baselon, the ninth company there, uh, Baselon is credited with taking out that whole Japanese company. Him and his wow. other men beside him, it was it was his machine guns. Maybe he had two other machine guns fully operational, thirty yards away from him. Mm. And they were firing too. Then he had a thirty-seven millimeter. I was speaking to the guy who was a thirty-seven millimeter um, gunner on that. His young seventeen-year-old, George Mason. And he just said uh, the bat, that Italian kid. He kept calling him the Italian kid, even though George was seventeen at the time and Barcelona was in his probably you know mid mid to late twenties. He said, "Yeah, that Italian kid." He kept shooting all the time. I said, like, "Yeah, George." <laughs> George George is funny, and, and and Brian actually took him and he fired his thirty seven millimeter. This was like a few years ago. George unfortunately passed away. He was ninety seven years old. And George said he'd never fired a thirty seven millimeter at night when the Japanese were attacking. He said the first time he fired it. He said he thought the effing thing blew up because a big, you know, he'd never fired it at night before. And this big um, flash went off. Yeah. With the yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, so I'll just mention Vandergriff real quick. Oh, that's the Barcelona area. So you're looking at it from the Japanese position. Yeah. Um, so the Barcelona area, in reality, it's probably, it's, it's probably a bit further to the right. This is the, well, I call it the, the tourist Barcelona hole people go to because it's easy to take people there but um in my in my research in the last few years i've i've got some good evidence but yeah, it's okay. served the purpose and it's a good good place you yeah, can just I see how close it was I'm, I'm standing where the barbed wire line is and that you probably can't see it in there but there's a uh, the tape around yeah you can just see it on the right bottom right hand corner you can just see the tape then again you can see it in that for a little bit to it there and a good point. I know that the monument isn't exactly in that location, but Ross Cable, our Aussie uh, uh, um, viewer, is saying, has the plaque been replaced on the monument? When I went up there, I saw the late, great John Innes showing two serving Marines about. Oh, uh, there was, yeah. I don't think they were, I've never seen one on that at the Barcelona area, Ross, um, unless he's talking about the top of Bloody Ridge. I know there was some things put in there, but yeah, the, the locals have been digging in those those holes in the past three okay. or four years. So if anything's there, it's gone. They're starting to okay. they're starting to um log that area too. Okay, but uh, Vandergriff, we're going to talk about him, and, then, and there's a plaque there with a list of um of of the Medal of Honor recipients or yeah, there's twenty two there. Yeah, Vandergriff. I mean, he's kind of like a the MacArthur Medal yeah, of Honor. Yeah, being clear, he's talking about Bloody Ridge Monument. There is the one he's talking about. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's still there, Ross. So they've put a the, the Raiders. Raiders have got a major monument there, put in twenty seventeen for the seventy okay. fifth. Maybe I'll take Ross there one day. Good yeah, he's taking he's taking me and Colin and Mag and and Matt through. Um, we're going to Budapest, Vienna, and Prague with him in November. So I'm really oh, looking, wow. and his brother. So we're looking forward to. I haven't <laughs> been to that part of the world for uh, whatever. So um, anyway, Vandergriff. Yeah, so Vandergriff's the last one. So Vandergriff was kind of like uh, I hate. The, comparing to MacArthur because Vandergriff, uh, you know, I'm just saying he didn't do an individual act that the medal is normally awarded for yeah. or, or earned for. He was given it for just being overall command of the division. So normally you don't see it given to a, a general. Once again, it's, it's it was for propaganda. You know, it's the first big victory, um, long sustained victory when they did a hero and uh, they gave it to uh, Vandergriff, um, the medal. But he didn't do a, a specific uh, for act for it. And um, so I don't know if I think it was. And he labor came to Commandant after that and then the war and we, he, he rose to, to, to good heights. But I think it was like, yeah, I'll take it. Yes, sir. What I'll do, I'll follow my orders. Because once again, it was, I think Roosevelt was probably behind it. Um, right. And there was a few um, like that. Um, he definitely uh, earns his praise. He, what he did was like, pretty good um the brains was the the chief of staff gerald thomas 
Okay. Vandegrift well, was not blind too, by the way. He used to have to have a big, big flashlight or torch when he'd go out. When nighttime comes, he couldn't see see from diddly squat. Wow, that's, that, not not ideal. <laughs> in, yeah, in, 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 they they like, look yeah. after him that way because they said, "Oh, the old man's out there, blind again." Wow, that's, walk, that's an amazing story. But it, it leads us because the Medal of Honor awards and David O'Keefe, who's actually gone because he's catching a flight now. But the question he asked right at the beginning, and it's for the end, he said, "Are there others, any others, who have been passed over for a Medal of Honor who are now getting a second chance with the new review process in with the American military, or any other one else you can think of in all your research that maybe should have got the Medal of Honor and didn't?" Oh, I mean, there's always, always a few in every campaign. I mean, we see some uh, recently been um, awarded, and it's always coming up, especially some recently from Vietnam. But I think Guadalcanal, the big one right now that, you know, there's been years and years and big pushes, and it probably would be another push is, and I mentioned it in my Chesty Puller episode, is Chesty Puller. Now, Puller was actually nominated for the medal. He was nominated for a medal in the Battle of Henderson Field, and I think I discussed it in a Puller episode. And, he basically did the same thing to Edson did um, during the – so he's – then the October battle, with the one that we discussed with Paige and Barcelona, he, he basically inspired his men. He was up on the front line, and he was running around doing all kinds of stuff, just like Edson. But um, Chesty, once again, he had a few distractors and I wouldn't say enemies, but he'd already had at that stage uh, two Navy crosses, and he was nominated for a Medal of Honor. And it got to division level with Vandegrift and Thomas, and they said, "Nope, nope, we're we're giving him a third Navy Cross." And he, he received a third Navy Cross. But there's always been a push to try to get Puller. I mean, he's got five well, Navy Crosses. Does he need one another of the one? Things I get asked, not that I've got much clout, but I've get I've been asked to you know give a voice to various campaigns, and I can think of. Uh, uh, Woodson, the, the, the African American Omaha Beach, who should have maybe got the Medal of Honor. General Cota is another one they're trying to get the Medal of Honor for not for, for Normandy. And uh, and as much as I often see merit in these individual cases, and I go, yeah, that absolutely makes sense. I don't think I've ever seen one of these cases that I can't see the reason why they're trying to bring this medal out for this mm. person. But the other part of me thinks, but but they they weren't given at the time. And unless you look at every single action from every single unit across the board and put it through some kind of system, there's always going to be injustices. Life isn't fair. I mean, mm. you know, you could read about any unit and say, well, that lot didn't seem to get very many medals or that lot didn't seem to get any recognition. I mean, I'm planning my Salerno series right now and there are divisions out there that there are not a single book on. The, Amer the British 46th Infantry Division, for example, there's nothing on them. It's, well, there was a regimental history part or divisional history published in 1947. There's nothing. You know, the 56th Division is very little. And the same applies with the American divisions, army divisions out in the Pacific. Yes, I, I see merit in sometimes individuals were, were overlooked for a medal, but I think mm -hmm. any attempt 80 years on to go back and reevaluate is is inherently flawed life isn't fair there are lots of people that weren't were recognized what's your gut feeling as you know that th th these processes are i can see the better what's, what's your feeling well as you know then and now a lot of it's politically uh driven um, yep. there's all kinds of agendas behind uh, medals for whatever reason i mean a lot of these guys probably i wouldn't say care less but yeah some of them just want to get on with their lives get about it so to speak yeah, and, and, right. and people see imagine you know the, the combat guys they see people do all kinds of things it, it rates the medal of honors and they never get a mention either they die or no one was there to witness it or or they've seen guys who earn medals not so much medal of honors and they think well how did he get it and or she did it so yeah but the, the other thing is is that i mean i've met countless veterans from countless wars from countless countries and it's not something most veterans use as a measure of what they did they talk about the the camaraderie they talk about you don't ever meet a veteran who says oh let me tell you about when i was awarded my bronze star or let me tell you about when i got my this dso it's not it's it's never been the veterans yardstick of what they did or what they didn't it's always the medals are to some extent for the public they're to they're they're for propaganda purposes they are to give an a symbol for recruiting, but 
Yeah, it's 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 something that you know you you don't necessarily hear the guys themselves. The minute I ever meet a vet who starts in the, in my first minute of talking to him, listing his decorations or her decorations, I'm a min- yeah. my radar immediately goes, yeah, yeah, something odd here because it's just <laughs> it's unusual. Yeah. You, know, you you hear yeah. about heroism from others. They say they they will play downplay what they did and talk about their friends, and so. Yeah. The medal system is interesting, but either way, it's the, what you've done today with us has been a fascinating insight into the Guadalcanal, Guadalcanal campaign, and particularly, I think, how important machine guns were, as you mm-hmm. said earlier. Oh. That, that, the, the fact that so you know, the, the five were machine gunners, uh, it, it's it's significant, it tells us something about the nature of that campaign, mm-hmm. yeah, brilliant, yeah. Well, I've really um enjoyed it, and thanks for having me again. And I'll well, we'll have you back anytime. So, folks, I'm not on again tonight, but Lucy is doing a World War One TV show with Megan Keller talking about Commonwealth War Graves and their commemoration. And then I'm back tomorrow. We're talking about the sand split assault with Ryan Larry. And Sarah is on on Sunday talking about 10 facts you should know about the U.S. It's Indianapolis. And so and then there's more stuff coming up next week. We've got Nazis talking about we've got forgers. We've got all sorts of things coming up. But, folks, thank you very much for your questions. Thank you very much for your um, your, your your viewership today. And, Dave, as always, it's been great talking to you. And, folks, if you haven't already, go and check Dave's channel for more information on all of these stories. So thanks everybody for watching. This is Paul Bernard for World War II TV saying enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers, everybody. Bye.